Nasal cavity is divided into two by nasal septum. Problems arise when it is not dividing it symmetrically, leading to a condition known as DNS, or deviated nasal septum. Causes of DNS There are four important causes. Number one is trauma. Any abnormal pressure applied to nasal septum results in its deviation to one side or another. Example, being hit by a boxer on the nose. Number two is developmental, or abnormalities acquired during the formation of nasal septum. Example, palate forms the base of nasal septum. If palate is high arched, then automatically nasal septum deviation will occur. Number three is racial. Some races, like Caucasians, have more incidence of DNS. Number four is hereditary. Some families have more incidence of DNS. Types of DNS. One, anterior dislocation. The nasal septum is dislocated into one of the nasal chambers. Two, C-shaped dislocation. Septum is deviated in a simple curve to one side. Compensatory hypertrophy of turbinates occur in other side. Three, S-shaped deformity. Nasal septum shows S-shaped deformity. This results in bilateral nasal obstruction. 4. Spurs. Shelf-like projection. It touches lateral wall and may give rise to headaches. Clinical features of DNS. Clinical features of DNS can be simply remembered using the mnemonic Nasim has DNS. N is for nasal obstruction. Naturally, any deviation in nasal septum causes less nasal space and results in nasal obstruction on the side of DNS. A is for insomnia. Patient is unable to smell, as there is failure of inspired air to reach the olfactory region. Loss of smell may be partial or total. S is for sinitis, since all sinuses have only one opening, and that's in the lateral wall of nose. DNS causes obstruction of these openings due to nasal obstruction. E is for epistaxis. E is for external deformity, particularly in young females or males who are more conscious of this. M is for middle ear infection. DNS also predisposes to middle ear infection because eustachian tube, which is the only drainage source of middle ear, opens in nasopharynx and DNS can cause its obstruction and resulting in middle ear infections. Treatment Minor cases of DNS require no treatment. If the symptoms are severe, then on reaching the age of 17, we can opt for septoplasty, in which the most deviated parts of nasal septum are removed and the rest of septum is corrected and repositioned using plastic means. A more radical form of this operation is submucous resection, in which mucoperichondral and mucoperistitial flaps overlying one side of the septum are lifted. Most of the septum is removed and flaps repositioned. Allergic rhinitis. Rhine comes from Greek word meaning nose, and itis means inflammation. So, it means inflammation of the nose. And allergic means it's caused by allergens. Allergens are anything harmless or neutral that can be inhaled in air by nose and trigger excessive immune reaction. Common examples of allergens include pollen and dust. Once inside nose, they will meet immune system, particularly mast cells, attached to IgE antibodies. Allergen will bind to IgE antibody, which will then activate and alert mast cells. In a normal person, the reaction is minimal. But in those suffering from allergic rhinitis, this cell overreacts big time. It signals to all cells in surrounding by releasing histamine. Histamine will now cause inflammation and swelling up of nasal mucosa, which will then cause excessive mucus production. This results in nasal drip. This excessive mucus production will block two very important structures opening a nose. 1. Nasolacrimal duct. The purpose of this duct is to drain tears from eyes into nose but once blocked by excessive mucus production by allergic rhinitis, now you will start having watery eyes. 2. Eustachian tube. This drains drainage from middle ear, with it blocked too by excessive mucus production by allergic rhinitis. Now you will have stuffed ear sensation too. Finally, the nerves and nasal cavity will start getting irritated and lead to sneezing. All of it will lead to difficulty in breathing for persons suffering from allergic rhinitis. To summarize, allergic rhinitis will lead to 1. The swelling and congestion of nasal mucosa. 2. Watery eyes. 3. Stuffed ears. 4. Nasal drip due to excessive mucus production. 5. Sneezing. 6. Difficulty breathing. For diagnosis of allergic rhinitis, 1. Patient history. 
Usually the person complains of all symptoms mentioned above, and if the timing of these symptoms is specific and seasonal, then we can easily reach a diagnosis of seasonal allergic rhinitis. 2. Skin Prick Testing In this test, allergen is introduced using a skin prick, and reaction of body is seen to confirm. Allergy to a particular allergen. 3. Blood Test A. Total Blood Eusinophil Count as with the total serum IgE, an elevated eusinophil count supports the diagnosis of allergic rhinitis. B. Total serum IgE. This is a measurement of the total level of IgE in the blood. An elevated serum IgE level supports allergic rhinitis diagnosis. This test can be performed using radioallergosorbent method. Hence, it is also called as RAS test. 4. Nasal smear test. A nasal smear can sometimes be helpful for establishing the diagnosis of allergic rhinitis. A sample of secretions and cells is scraped from the surface of the nasal mucosa using a special sampling probe. Treatment of allergic rhinitis is achieved by targeting different steps and pathway to allergy. 1. Avoid allergens. This can be done by taking precautionary measures to avoid exposure. For example, wearing face masks in pollen season. 2. Decrease inflammation. This can be achieved by steroids applied directly to nasal mucosa. 3. Antihistamines. These target the action of histamines by blocking the histamine receptors, thus stopping the action of histamine. 4. Mast cell stabilizers. Mast cell stabilizers are common medications used to prevent or control certain allergic disorders. They block a calcium channel essential for mast cell degranulation, stabilizing the cell and thereby preventing the release of histamine. 5. Immunotherapy. When you get immunotherapy in the form of allergy shots, your allergist or doctor injects small doses of substances that you are allergic to, allergens, under your skin. This helps your body get used to the allergen, which can result in fewer or less severe symptoms of allergic rhinitis. What is sinusitis? Before we can answer that question, we should talk a little bit about anatomy. Sinuses are hollow spaces in the bones around the nose that connect to the nose through small, narrow channels. Humans possess four paired paranasal sinuses. Your cheekbones hold your maxillary sinuses, the largest. The low center of your forehead is where your frontal sinuses are located. Between your eyes are your ethmoid sinuses. In bones behind your nose are your sphenoid sinuses. They're lined with soft pink tissue called mucosa. Sinusitis means your sinuses are inflamed. What causes sinusitis? 98% of sinusitis occur due to viral infection. It can also be caused by bacterial infection, while a small population can have it due to fungal disease. There are some predisposing factors that make it more likely that you get sinusitis, including allergic rhinitis, which makes it easier for infection to occur, exposure to smoke or cigarette smoking, anatomical abnormalities, which make it difficult for sinuses to drain, the central event in sinusitis is blockage of the sinus openings, or OSEA, as a result of inflammation. Unable to circulate air and eliminate the secretions that are produced, obstructed sinuses become an ideal environment for bacterial infection. Types of Sinusitis Types of sinusitis include acute sinusitis, which lasts up to 4 weeks, subacute sinusitis, which lasts 4 to 12 weeks, chronic sinusitis, which lasts more than 12 weeks and can continue for months or even years. Recurrent sinusitis with several attacks within a year. What are the signs and symptoms of sinusitis? First thing that most people notice is going to be pain. The pain may be localized to the sinus involved or it can also cause generalized pain which may present as headache. If you tap on the sinus involved with finger, it can produce tenderness. Also, since the mucosa is inflamed, it will produce lots of mucus, which is going to drain into the nasal cavity through sinus openings or oshia. Once in the nasal cavity, there's only two things it can do. First thing is to come out of your nose so people will notice nasal discharge. The second thing it can do is go to the back of your throat as the back of your nose is related to back of your throat, and there it causes irritation and cause you to cough. Inflammation of mucosa can also alter the smell and taste of things. Patients can also have fever because of the infection and inflammation. How can we diagnose sinusitis? By and large, the diagnosis of sinusitis is made by symptoms alone. Common symptoms include nasal or postnasal drip, sinus pain or pressure, nasal congestion, decreased ability to smell, cough, headache, and fever. But sometimes the symptoms aren't clear-cut. In that case, there are some other tests that can be done to diagnose. 
Sometimes a medical practitioner will take a look inside your nose to get a better look at nasal or postnasal drip. This is called rhinoscopy. X-rays can be done to visualize sinuses. The gold standard to diagnose is CT scan. Other tests are only done if needed in special circumstances. How can we treat sinusitis? For acute viral sinusitis, the most common type of sinusitis, there is not a lot we can do to actually treat the disease itself, but we can treat symptoms. One of the first drugs to treat symptoms is going to be nasal decongestants. These medications shrink swollen nasal passages, facilitating the flow of drainage from the sinuses. We also give mucolytics medications, which help clear mucus. We also ask the patient to remain well hydrated, as being well hydrated helps in drainage of mucus, as mucus formed is not so sticky that it gets stuck in if your body is well hydrated. Finally, we also give painkillers to help relieve the pain. For acute bacterial sinusitis, we give all of the above plus antibiotics for 10 to 14 days. For chronic sinusitis, again, all of the above, but the antibiotics have to be given for a lot longer period. Most people recommend four to six weeks of antibiotics. If the sinusitis is too severe and the person is at risk of complications, we go for surgery. Surgery may be done to remove small amounts of bone or other material blocking the sinus openings or to remove growths blocking sinuses, also called as polyps. Normally, a thin lighted tool called an endoscope is inserted through the nose so the doctor can see and remove whatever is blocking the sinuses. Tonsillitis and Tonsillectomy When a person opens his mouth, there are a lot of things you can see. One of the most important organs that help fight off infection are among them, also known as tonsils. Tonsils are often overlooked when you open your mouth. This is because they are often small and hidden between the two arches. These tonsils are known as palatine tonsils due to their location near the palate or the roof of the mouth. How tonsils fight off infection? The tonsils act like a sentry point for the throat, picking up virus and bacteria particles which are breathed in or swallowed and relaying these to the immune system. To help with this role, the surfaces of the tonsils are pitted with a number of little recesses, also called tonsil crypts. These increase the surface area of the tonsils, relaying more viruses and bacteria to the immune system. How tonsils get infected? Tonsils can also become clogged with bacteria and food particles, which can lead to problems. When this happens, the tonsil itself becomes infected and starts to get swollen due to inflammation because of infection leading to condition known as tonsillitis or inflammation of the tonsils. Because the tonsils are always trapping bacteria, they can become infected quite commonly, especially in children, leading to condition known as recurrent acute tonsillitis. Signs and Symptoms of Tonsillitis The main symptom of tonsillitis is sore throat, but since the throat and ears share the same nerves, the pain is often felt in the ears too. This process is known as referred pain. The pain is usually worse when swallowing, also known as odinophagia. Very young children may not complain of a sore throat, but may simply refuse to eat. In addition, you may also have a cough, fever due to infection, headache, feel sick, feel tired, and swollen and tender glands, lymph nodes on the sides of the neck as well as bad breath. How tonsillitis is diagnosed? Diagnosis is based on a physical examination of your throat. Your doctor may also take a throat culture by gently swabbing the back of your throat. The culture will be sent to a laboratory to identify the bacteria causing the throat infection. Treatment for Tonsillitis A mild case of tonsillitis does not necessarily require treatment, especially if a virus, such as a cold, causes it. Good rest and remaining well hydrated are treatment of choice in such cases. Painkiller medicines can be added to relieve the throat pain. Treatments for more severe cases of tonsillitis may include antibiotics or a tonsillectomy. Antibiotics will be prescribed to fight a bacterial infection. It's important you complete the full course of antibiotics. Tonsillectomy is the surgical removal of tonsils to permanently end the problem of tonsillitis. Criteria for tonsillectomy At least 7 episodes in the previous year, at least 5 episodes in each of the previous 2 years, or at least 3 episodes in each of the previous 3 years. How tonsillectomy is done Dissection and snare method there are multiple methods to do tonsillectomy. One of the most commonly used is dissection and snare method. Steps of dissection and snare method. 1. Patient is placed in rose position. 2. Boyle-Davis mouth gag is introduced and opened, 
It is held in place by draffins, bipods, or a string over a pulley. 3. Tonsil is grasped with forceps and pulled medially. Incision made in the mucous membrane. 4. A blunt curved scissors may be used to dissect the tonsil from the peritonsillar tissue and separate its upper pole. 5. Tonsil is held at its upper pole and traction applied downwards and medially or scissors until lower pole is reached. 6. Wire loop of tonsillar snare is threaded over the tonsil onto its pedicle, tightened. 7. Pedicle is cut and the tonsil removed. 8. A gauze sponge is placed in the fossa and pressure applied for a few minutes. 9. Bleeding points are tied with silk. Procedure is repeated on the other side. Epistaxis. What is epistaxis? Bleeding from inside the nose is also known as epistaxis. Why does it occur? There are many different reasons. Most important ones are among children due to trauma due to nasal picking. Another important cause in children is foreign body and nose. Infections of nose, deviated nasal septum, raised blood pressure, kidney disease, and liver disease. What are the sites of epistaxis? 1. Most important site of epistaxis in nose is Little's area. In 90% of cases, epistaxis occurs from here. It is situated in antero-inferior part of nasal septum. Four arteries, anterior ethmoidal, septal branch of superior lobule, septal branch of sphenopalatine, and the greater palatine artery, anastomose here. 2. Posterior part of nasal cavity. After bleeding from here, blood flows directly into pharynx. Diffuse, it is bleeding from septum and lateral wall. This is often seen in general systemic disorders and blood dyscarsias. How will you manage a case of epistaxis? In any case of epistaxis, it is important to ask the patients, 1. Mode of onset. Was it spontaneous or was there fingernail trauma? 2. Duration and frequency of bleeding. 3. Amount of blood loss. 4 side of nose from where bleeding is occurring, or is it occurring from both sides of nose? 5. Any known bleeding tendency in patient or family. 6. Any history of drug intake, analgesics, anticoagulants, etc. How will you treat epistaxis? 1. First aid. Most of time, bleeding occurs from Little's area and can be controlled by pinching nose with thumb and index for 5 minutes. This compresses blood vessels of Little's area, 2. Cauterization. Useful in patients where bleeding point has been located. 3. Anterior nasal packing. 4. Posterior nasal packing. General measures. 1. Make the patient sit up. 2. Reassure the patient. 3. Keep check on pulse and BP. Nasal polyp. What is a nasal polyp? Nasal polyp are fleshy swellings that develop in the lining mucosa of the nose and paranasal sinuses, air-filled spaces linked to the nasal cavity. They are non-cancerous growths. What causes nasal polyp? The mucosa is a very wet layer that helps protect the inside of your nose and sinuses and humidifies the air you breathe. During an infection or allergy-induced irritation, the nasal mucosa becomes swollen and red. With prolonged irritation, the mucosa may form a polyp. A polyp is a round growth, like a small cyst, that can block nasal passages. Although some people can develop polyps with no previous nasal problems, there's often a trigger for developing polyps. These triggers include A. Chronic or recurring sinus infections. B. Asthma. C. Allergic rhinitis. What are the symptoms of nasal polyp? Polyps can grow large enough to block your nasal passages, resulting in chronic congestion. Symptoms can include 1. Nasal congestion, a sensation that your nose is blocked. 2. Runny nose. 3. Postnasal drip, which is when excess mucus runs down the back of your throat. 4. Reduced sense of smell. 5. Breathing through your mouth. 6. A feeling of pressure in your forehead or face. What are the major types of nasal polyp? There are two major types of nasal polyp. 1. Antrochoanal, single, unilateral originate from maxillary sinus, usually found in children. Infections is the common cause. 2. Ethmoidal, bilateral, originate from ethmoid sinuses, 
usually found in adults. Allergy is the common cause. How are nasal polyps diagnosed? A doctor will generally be able to make a diagnosis after asking about symptoms and examining the patient's nose. The doctor may also order the following test. Nasal endoscopy. A narrow tube with a small camera is inserted into the patient's nose. CT scan. This enables the doctor to locate nasal polyps and other abnormalities linked to chronic inflammation. The doctor will also be able to identify any other obstructions. What is the treatment for nasal polyps? The following treatments are commonly used for nasal polyps. 1. Steroids. The doctor may prescribe a steroid spray or nose drops, which will shrink the polyps by reducing inflammation. 2. Steroid tablets. In cases of larger polyps or more severe inflammation, the patient may be prescribed steroid tablets. 3. Other medications. Other medications may be given to treat conditions that are making the inflammation worse. Examples include antihistamines for allergies, antibiotics for bacterial infections, and antifungal drugs for fungal allergies. 4. Surgery. Polypectomy. This is the most common procedure for the removal of polyps. The patient is given general anesthesia, a long thin tube with a video camera is inserted into the patient's nose and sinuses. Polyps are then cut out using microtelescope to visualize it and surgical instruments to cut it. After surgery, the patient will most likely be prescribed a corticosteroid nasal spray to help prevent reoccurrence. Management of Deaf Child Who were deaf children and why should they be identified early? Children with profound, greater than 90 decibel hearing loss or total deafness fail to develop speech and have often been termed as deaf and mute or deaf and dumb. However, these children have no defect in their speech-producing apparatus. The main defect is deafness. They have never heard speech and therefore do not develop it. In lesser degrees of hearing loss, speech does develop, but it is defective. The period from birth to five years of life is critical for the development of speech and language. Therefore, there is need for early identification and of hearing loss and early rehabilitation in infants and children. It was observed that children whose hearing loss was observed and managed before six months of age had higher scores of vocabulary better expressive and comprehensive language skills than those diagnosed and managed after six months of age, emphasizing the importance of early identification and treatment. Assessment of auditory function in neonates, infants, and children demands special techniques. A. Screening procedures. They are employed to test hearing in high-risk infants and are based on infants' behavioral response to the sound signal. Arousal test. A high-frequency narrow-band noise is presented for two seconds to the infant when he is in light sleep. A normal hearing infant can be aroused twice when three such stimuli are presented to him. Auditory response cradle is a screening device for newborns where baby is placed in a cradle and his behavior including trunk and limb movement, head jerk, and respiration in response to auditory stimulation are monitored by transducers. It can screen babies with moderate, severe, or profound hearing loss. B. Behavior Observation Audiometry Auditory signal presented to an infant produces a change in behavior. In other words, alerting, cessation of an activity, widening of eyes, or facial grimacing. Morrow's reflex is one of them and consists of sudden movements of limbs and extension of head in response to sound of 80 to 90 decibels. In cochleopalpable reflex, the child responds by a blink to a loud sound. In secession reflex, an infant stops activity or starts crying in response to a sound of 90 decibel. C. Distraction techniques are used in children 6 to 7 months old. The child at this age turns his head to locate the source of sound. In this test, the child is seated in his mother's lap. An assistant distracts the child's attention while the examiner produces a sound from behind or from the side to see if the child tries to locate it. D. Conditioning techniques. 
Examples of this technique include play audiometry. The child is conditioned to perform act, such as putting a plastic block in a bucket each time the child hears a sound signal. Each correct performance of the act is reinforced with praise, encouragement, or reward. Speech audiometry. The child is asked to repeat the names of certain objects or to point them out on the pictures. The voice can be gradually lowered. In this way, hearing level and speech discrimination can be tested. The test can also be used to examine the child's expressive ability when he is asked to name the toys like horse, duck, or objects like cup, plate, etc. E. Objective tests. These tests are ideal for hearing assessment in children as they give results without the need of cooperation of child. Names of objective tests include 1. Evoked response audiometry, 2. Autoacoustic emissions, 3. Impedance audiometry. Management of Deaf Child It is essential to know the degree and type of hearing loss. Aims of rehabilitation of any hearing-impaired child are development of speech and language, adjustment in society, and useful employment in a vocation. 1. Parental Guidance It is a great emotional shock for parents to learn that their child is deaf. They should be dealt with sympathetically so as to accept the child. They should be told of child's disability and how to care for it. Rehabilitation of the deaf demands a lot from parents. Care and periodic replacement of hearing aid, change of ear molds as child grows, follow-up visits for re-evaluation, education at home, and the selection of vocation. 2. Hearing aids. Most deaf children have a small but useful port ion of residual hearing, which can be exploited by amplification of sound. Hearing aids should be prescribed as early as possible. If necessary, binaural aids, one for each ear, can be used. Hearing aids help to develop lip reading also. 3. Development of speech and language. Communication is a two-way process, depending on the receptive and expressive skills. Reception of information is through visual, auditory, or tactile faculties, which expression is through oral or written speech or the manual sign language. In the hearing impaired, auditory faculty is poor or totally absent. Thus, for proper communication, there is need either to improve hearing through amplification of the residual hearing or cochlear implants, and in the absence of feasibility of developing the auditory faculty, to develop visual or tactile means of communication. A. Auditory Oral Communication This is the method used by a normal person and is the best way of communication. In the deaf, it can be used in those with moderate to severe hearing loss or those who are postlingually deaf. Hearing aids are provided to augment auditory reception. At the same time, training is also imparted in speech reading. In other words, to read movements of lips, face, and natural gestures of hand and body. Expressive skill is encouraged through oral speech. B. Manual communication. It makes use of the sign language. C. Total communication. It uses all modalities of sensory input, in other words, auditory, visual, etc. Such children are taught to develop oral speech, lip reading, and sign language. All children with prelingual severe to profound deafness should undergo training in this form of communication. 4. Education of the Deaf There are residential and day schools for the deaf. Some deaf children with moderate hearing loss can be integrated into schools for the normal children with preferential seating in the class giving them benches closer to teachers so that they can hear the teacher louder. 5. Vocational Guidance The deaf are sincere and good workers. Given the opportunity, commensurate with their ability, they can be usefully employed in several vocations.
Acute Otitis Media What is Acute Otitis Media? Acute stands for Abrupt Onset. Ot stands for Ear. Itis stands for Infection and Inflammation, while Media stands for Middle Ear. So, Acute Otitis Media means Inflammation of the Middle Ear. What are the stages of Acute Otitis Media? 1. Stage of Tubal Occlusion since the middle ear drainage is entirely dependent on eustachian tube. The first step in acute otitis media is the blockage of eustachian tube. Children are particularly predisposed to acute otitis media because their eustachian tube is shorter, wider, and more horizontal as compared to adults, which increases the chances of their eustachian tube getting blocked. 2. Stage of presuppuration. After the eustachian tube is blocked, the microorganisms start infecting. 3. Stage of suppuration. This is marked by formation of pus in the middle ear. Tympanic membrane starts bulging to the point of rupture. 4. Stage of resolution. The tympanic membrane rupture, with release of pus and subsidence of symptoms. Inflammatory process begins to resolve. If proper treatment is started early, or if the infection was mild, resolution may start even without rupture of tympanic membrane. 5. Stage of complication. If virulence of organism is high or resistance of patient poor, resolution may not take place and disease spreads beyond the confines of middle ear. Treatment 1. Antibacterial therapy. It is indicated in all cases with fever and severe earache. 2. Decongestant nasal drops. Nose drops should be used to relieve eustachian tube edema and promote ventilation of middle ear. 4. Analgesics and antipyretics help to relieve pain and bring down temperature. 5. Ear Toilet If there is discharge in the ear, it is dry mopped with sterile cotton buds and a wick moistened with antibiotic may be inserted. 6. Dry Local Heat It helps to relieve pain. 7. Miringotomy It is incising the drum to evacuate pus and is indicated when A. Drum is bulging and there is acute pain. B. There is an incomplete resolution despite antibiotics when drum remains full with persistent conductive deafness. C. There is persistent effusion beyond 12 weeks. All cases of acute suppurative otitis media should be carefully followed till drum membrane returns to its normal appearance. Adenoids. What are adenoids? The nasopharyngeal tonsils, commonly called adenoids, is situated at the junction of the roof and posterior wall of the nasopharynx. Adenoid tissue is present at birth, shows physiological enlargement up to the age of six years, and then tends to atrophy at puberty and almost completely disappears by the age of 20. Why and when do they cause trouble? Adenoids are subject to physiological enlargement in childhood. Certain children have a tendency to generalized lymphoid hyperlasia in which adenoids also take part. Recurrent attacks of rhinitis, sinusitis, or chronic tonsillitis may cause chronic adenoid infection and hyperlasia. Allergy of the upper respiratory tract may also contribute to the enlargement of adenoids. Clinical features. Symptoms and signs depend not merely on the absolute size of the adenoid mass, but are relative to the available space in the nasopharynx. Enlarged and infected adenoids may cause nasal, oral, ear, or general symptoms. A. Nasal Symptoms 1. Nasal obstruction is the commonest symptom. This leads to mouth breathing. Nasal obstruction also interferes with feeding or suckling a child. As respiration and feeding cannot take place simultaneously, a child with adenoid enlargement fails to thrive. 2. Nasal Discharge it is partly due to coanal obstruction, as the normal nasal secretions cannot drain into nasopharynx and partly due to associated chronic rhinitis. The child often has a wet, bubbly nose. 3. Sinusitis Chronic maxillary sinusitis is commonly associated with adenoids. It is due to persistence of nasal discharge and infection. Reverse is also true, 
that a primary maxillary sinusitis may lead to infected and enlarged adenoids. 4. Epistaxis When adenoids are acutely inflamed, epistaxi can occur with nose blowing. 5. Voice change, which is toneless and loses nasal quality due to nasal obstruction. B. Oral symptoms 1. Tubal obstruction Adenoid mass blocks the eustachian tube leading to retracted, tympanic membrane and conductive hearing loss. 2. Recurrent attacks of acute otitis media or infection of middle ear may occur due to spread of infection via the eustachian tube because the eustachian tube is blocked due to adenoid's hypertrophy. 3. Chronic superative otitis media or long-standing infection of middle ear occurs if the otitis media fails to resolve in the presence of infected adenoids. C. General Symptoms 1. Adenoid facies. Chronic nasal obstruction and mouth breathing lead to characteristic facial appearance called adenoid facies. The child has an elongated face with dull expression, prominent open mouth for breathing, and crowded upper teeth and hitched up upper lip. Nose gives a pinched-in appearance due to disuse atrophy of a lay nasi. Hard palate in these cases is highly arched as the molding action of the tongue on palate is lost because the child has to always keep the mouth open for breathing. 2. Pulmonary Hypertension In long-standing nasal obstruction due to adenoid hypertrophy, the oxygen-reaching lungs is decreased so the blood pressure in pulmonary artery increases to carry the oxygen needed for tissues of body, which can cause pulmonary hypertension and coropulmonale. Diagnosis Examination of postnasal space is possible in some young children, and an adenoid mass can be seen with a mirror. Soft tissue lateral radiograph of nasopharynx will reveal the size of adenoid and also the extent to which nasopharyngeal airspace has been compromised. Detailed nasal examination should always be conducted to exclude other causes of nasal obstruction. Treatment When symptoms are not marked, Breathing exercises, decongestant nasal drops, and antihistamines for any coexistent nasal allergy can cure the condition without need of the surgery. When symptoms are marked, adenoidectomy is done for complete removal of adenoids. Acute epiglottitis. Causes, Symptoms, Treatment. It is an acute inflammatory condition confined to supraglottic structures, which include epiglottis, aripiglottic folds, and artenoids. There is marked edema of these structures, which may obstruct the airway. What causes epiglottitis? It is a serious condition and affects children of 2 to 7 years of age, but can also affect adults. H. influenza B is the most common organism responsible for this condition in children. Clinical Features 1. Onset of symptoms is abrupt with rapid progression. 2. Sore throat and dysphagia are the common presenting symptoms in adults. 3. Dyspnea and stridor are the common presenting symptoms in children. They are rapidly progressive and may prove fatal unless relieved. 4. Fever may go up to 40 degrees Celsius. It is due to septicemia. Patient's condition may rapidly deteriorate. Examination 1. Depressing the tongue with a tongue depressor may show red and swollen epiglottis. Indirect laryngoscopy may show edema and congestion of supraglottic structure. This examination is avoided for fear of precipitating complete obstruction. It is better done in operation theater where facilities for intubation are available. 2. Lateral soft tissue x-ray of neck may show swollen epiglottis, thumb sign. Treatment 1. Hospitalization Essential because of the danger of respiratory obstruction. 2. Antibiotics Ampicillin or third-generation cephalosporin are effective against H. influenza and are given by parenteral round, IM or IV, without waiting for results for throat swab and blood culture. 3. Steroids Given in appropriate doses, relieve edema, and may obviate need for tracheostomy. 4. 
adequate hydration. Patient may require parenteral fluids. 5. Humidification and oxygen. 6. Intubation or tracheostomy may be required for respiratory obstruction. Acute laryngotracheobronchitis causes, features, treatment. What is acute laryngotracheobronchitis? It is an inflammatory condition of the larynx, trachea, and bronchi, more common than acute epiglottitis. What causes acute laryngotracheobronchitis? Mostly, it is viral infection. Parainfluenza type 1 and 2, affecting children between 6 months to 3 years of age. Male children are more often affected. Secondary bacterial infection by gram-positive cochi soon supervenes. What happens in acute laryngotracheobronchitis? The loose areolar tissue in the subglottic region swells up and causes respiratory obstruction and stridor. This coupled with the thick tenacious secretions and crust may completely occlude the airway. What are the symptoms? Disease starts as upper respiratory infection with hoarseness and croppy cough. There is fever of 39 to 4 degrees Celsius. This may be followed by difficulty in breathing, an inspiratory type of stridor. Respiratory difficulty may gradually increase with signs of upper airway obstruction. In other words, suprasternal and intercoastal recession. What is the treatment? 1. Hospitalization is often essential because of the increasing difficulty in breathing. 2. Antibiotics like ampicillin, 50 mg or kilograms a day, in divided doses is effective against secondary infections due to gram-positive cocci and H. influenza. 3. Humidification helps to soften crust and tenacious secretions which block tracheal bronchial tree. 4. Parenteral fluids are essential to combat dehydration. 5. Steroids, in other words, hydrocortisone, 100 mg IV, may be useful to relieve edema. 6. Adrenaline. 7. Intubation or tracheostomy is done should respiratory obstruction increase in spite of the above measures. Tracheostomy is done if intubation is required beyond 72 hours. Assisted ventilation may be required. Chronic Suppurative Otitis Media Put simply, CSOM is a perforated tympanic membrane with persistent drainage from the middle ear lasting more than 12 weeks. CSOM is initiated by an episode of acute infection. The pathophysiology of CSOM begins with irritation and subsequent inflammation of the middle ear mucosa. The inflammatory response creates mucosal edema and increased middle ear discharge, eventually leading to tympanic membrane perforation. A perforation becomes permanent when its edges are covered by squamous epithelium and it does not heal spontaneously. Types of CSOM Clinically, it is divided into two types. 1. Tubotympanic, also called the safe or benign type. It involves anterior inferior part of middle ear cleft and is associated with a central perforation. There is little risk of serious complications. 2. Adicoantral, also called unsafe or dangerous type. It involves posterosuperior part of the cleft, in other words, attic, antrum, and mastoid, and is associated with an attic or a marginal perforation. The disease is often associated with a bone-eroding process such as cholesteatoma, 
risk of complications is high in this type. Investigations 1. Examination under microscope 2. Audiogram It gives an assessment of degree of hearing loss and its type. 3. Culture and sensitivity of ear discharge It helps to select proper antibiotic eardrops. Treatment the aim is to control infection and eliminate ear discharge and, at a later stage, to correct the hearing loss by surgical means. 1. Oral toilet. Remove all discharge and debris from the ear. 2. Eardrops. Antibiotic eardrops are used. They are combined with steroids which have local anti-inflammatory effect. 3. Systemic antibiotics. 4. Precautions for patient. Patients are instructed to keep water out of the ear during bathing, swimming, and hair wash. 5. Treatment of contributory causes. Attention should be paid to treat causes contributing to disease, for example, adenoids and nasal allergy. 6. Surgical treatment. Once ear is dry, meringoplasty can be done to restore hearing. 